Hi, uh, I'm Miles Borens. I'm a product manager at GitHub, a contributor to the Node.js project. I sit on the technical steering committee and have also helped um, extensively with our modules team. I also do standards work at TC39, where you may know me from uh, such proposals as top level weight and import attributes. Um, I'm joined today by Guy Bedford. Uh, Guy, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, Miles. Uh, so I, I do a lot of open source work. Um, the main projects I've been working on are uh, System.js and JSPM, and I also do software consulting and have collaborated with Miles quite a bit in the past from Node.js to uh, TC39 as well. Thanks, Guy. Um, this session was titled um, Developer Fan Fiction Modules Edition which was heavily inspired by um, this kind of tongue-in-cheek phrase that I use uh, sometimes called developer fan fiction, which is where like, you know, either people are opening issues or they're, they're kind of like writing speculative fiction about what the, what the future looks like or what they think things will be. Um, I mean, sometimes these are also just called feature requests. Um, but the guy and I have been actively working quite a lot on the module system in JavaScript, um, both at like the standards uh, at TC39 and making sure that like the you know like fundamental building blocks are there and work, um, but also in the platform, uh, particularly of, of Node.js, to make sure that the actual implementation of this um, is something that people can use. And this ranges from everything from uh, like just making sure that, that a file can actually uh, load based on a specifier to um, examining different uh, formats. Uh, and what we find ourselves rather often actually having to write developer fan fiction because we consistently run into problems that we can't solve the way that we expected them to. Um, in particular, you know, different runtimes have different requirements. Um, the browser and node have different security models and different fundamental infrastructures. And even newer runtimes like Deno um, have completely different requirements because, for example, they aren't um, bogged down by the legacy of node and they're able to do, you know, something like let's examine URL, URL based loaders rather than, um, you know, relying on package managers. Um, Guy, do you have any uh, kind of insight into to some of the places where, where you have found recently um, you're writing some developer fan fiction? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think when, when you're working in open source, half the joy of open source is that you get to, to write this fan fiction. So, uh, you know, that, that's where the, the excitement is and the interest is because we all get to be a part of this. We all get to, to build these things. I mean, JavaScript is, is quite unique in that way. Many languages, they have a, a sort of a, a core team that decides what the experience of the language is, what, what the, how, how it works in all these details. And you're, you're a user of it, you're a consumer of it, and you don't get much of a say. I mean, you can post those feature requests, but uh, with JavaScript, there is no core team. There's TC39, which decides the specifications of the language, but TC39's responsibility doesn't encompass the entire um, usage of the language. As you say, tools like Dino get to decide how they want to do things. Browsers get to decide how they want to do things. Uh, so all around, as, as we're using the language, we're writing this, this fan fiction. And uh, I mean, that, that's exactly you know what we were talking about earlier uh, today, uh, how tools like Webpack have, have led to this uh, explosion of what we're currently calling flow modules. Uh, that uh, in, in itself is, is a form of, of fan fiction of, of how tools have been able to shape how we use JavaScript and, and create, uh, create those um, workflows for us. Uh, it was never decided from the top. Yeah, it's, it's sort of everyone's working together to build the language. Yeah, uh, faux modules are, are one of those things I find uh, particularly interesting um, in that you know, people have been writing ESM, and I want to kind of say ESM, uh, for years, and I don't mean this in like a derogatory way, um, but what is really interesting when you're using a tool like Babel or a tool like Webpack um, or, or even TypeScript to a certain extent um, to write your modules, they're going through a build phase. And, and that build phase um, allows you to do some fancy things that you couldn't do otherwise. Um, one of the things that I find particularly interesting is 
this is a theory of mine. I don't know that it's true, but I believe that a lot of people um, adopted ESM um, rather early uh, simply for wanting destructuring, which interestingly enough, named imports is actually a completely different feature in the language from destructuring um, regarding how it works. Um, but looking at the text itself, at the source text, you know, like import thing in braces from module um, looks very similar to like um, const braces thing equals require thing. Um, that probably would work a lot better if I actually had some text and perhaps when we edit this, I'll, I'll add uh, a little writing on top. So, so it's not just me waving my hands. Um, but like, the, obviously there's advantages to code splitting and, and tree shaking that you also get from named imports. Um, but realistically, at least in very early versions of Babel, um, it wasn't even using uh, the proper um, execution model that ESM specifies. It was more or less like taking those import statements and just converting them into require statements. And there's all these like interesting ways under the hood that uh, ESM is subtly different than common JS that actually has made the job in the Node.js modules team uh, just so much harder trying to figure out how to get these environments to play nicely. Um, because one of the goals that we had in Node Core was A, ensuring that we had spec compliance, and then B, ensuring um, that you know, we don't require any sort of transpilation or build step. And so if you were using Babel or if you're using Webpack or if you're using TypeScript, um, you can do something like make a named import from a common JS module because you have that whole pass where you're compiling, where you can, you know, kind of sort all this stuff out. Um, this is why we call them faux modules, which in a way, and, and honestly, I wasn't thinking about it when I, when I came up with the title, but you're totally right. It's like a fun kind of like developer fan fiction from like three years ago when people were trying to speculate, like, what does it look like to write modules in three years? And, um, we all know we still haven't totally figured that out. Um, but I think maybe that's like a really fun um, jump into kind of like loaders and module types, right? Because the specifier, when you import a specifier and the specifier is like the string that you're importing from, there's so many things that we're used to doing, but like none of it is actually um, standardized. Like the idea of like how you resolve a specifier into a resource. Yeah. It's, it's a huge gap and, uh, you know, TC39 goes as far as saying it's a string and then every implementation is just like, okay, we'll, we'll do the thing that seems natural to us to do with it. Um, but everyone maybe treats it slightly differently or Node.js uses file paths um, and browsers use URLs and then there's minor differences between those, those systems and then uh, of course that gets on to, to file extensions, which for Node.js has been a um, I mean, actually, I full credit to you, Miles, because I, I never would have thought that it would have been possible to uh, remove the automatic file extension adding in Node.js. And I thought that was something that we would possibly have to live with this huge difference between the platforms. Um, but somehow, in, in this modules process, we managed to um, create um, the same resolution behavior between the browser and Node.js and for uh, when it comes to relative specifiers. I think getting those kind of details right was uh, so crucial for us to, to try and set a, a base for the language where um, and use their code between these different environments and not suddenly run into a whole bunch of, of bugs and issues um, when things don't work between these environments. And uh, yeah, I, I, I thought that was very, very cool that we could get that out of that process. I mean, is, is that something that, that you were always thinking about in the back of your mind, that these kind of universal use cases? Uh, yeah, yes and no. Um, universal uh, modules, or you know, as some people like to call it, isomorphic, but uh, just the idea that you can share code between environments has always been like near and dear to my heart. As someone who like, kind of uh, grew up in the like, paste some JavaScript in a browser and it works world, um, the specific, like, uh, changes that we made to the node resolution algorithm, specifically that in Node ESM implementation, if you import a module, you need to have its full file path. You can't, like it will not automatically resolve the file extensions and you can't import directories. Um, that was actually inspired by um, uh, Brad Farias, uh, was the one who kind of 
talked me into that. And I, I would actually like to tip the hat to Deno on this a little bit too. Um, Ryan Dahl and I had um, early conversations um, about this as we were designing this in Node and Ryan pushed forward for you know not recreating the Node file extension resolution. And it was actually one of like his core points in that like JS comp that you talked about. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I would argue that Deno in doing this helped pave the path in that like, I mean, back to this kind of fan fiction thing, not to like, not to like uh, drive the point to home a little too hard, <laughs> but like there was a lot of conversation that we had about like how would developers respond to this? Like we have this yeah. speculative future where we're removing this feature and there were members of the team who, who very much um, love that feature, still love that feature right. and think yeah. that it's a shame that we lost it. Um, and I think, you know, people come to me and they're like, you know, Miles, what do you think of Deno? You must hate it. And I'm like, no, I love JavaScript. Like the more places mm -hmm. to run it, the merrier, the more um, environments that we have that, that share similar um, kind of ethos to Node in being like yeah. server side runtime as opposed to a browser first, um, gives us more opportunity to, to think about like standardization and correlation um, across yeah. runtimes. Um, I love the fact that Deno helped pave the path here. And I think that there's a number of different examples um, where like having another runtime like Deno, and again, yeah. one that isn't tied to the same degree of um, legacy, actually allows us to move forward faster. The fact that Deno shipped this and that people were not like up in arms was actually something <laughs> we could point to as a reason yeah. to do it in Node. And not just that, it's like, hey, well, like the browser's not gonna do this. And Deno, is not doing this. I really think that we shouldn't, and we were able to get it through. Um, one of the other ones that's really interesting, and you, you started talking about it briefly, was just kind of the, in, the inconsistencies between these environments. So like Node for a long time has, has had this thing called bare imports, and that's where the specifier is neither a URL nor a relative path or an absolute path, it is just a string. And Node has a whole algorithm using package.json in the Node modules folder uh, to, determine, to determine how you turn that specifier into a path on disk that you can load. And um, you know, a, a future I would love to see would be one where you can NPM install something on your system. And can you, can you hear those sirens right now? Okay. Yeah, welcome to uh, New York City. USA, home of the sirens. It was, it was nice and dramatic as you were getting to your point there. I mean, I thought, I thought it worked pretty well. <laughs> well. Well, I mean, this is what happens when you do it live. Um, but so the point that I was getting at was, you know, browsers don't have any concept of bare specifiers at all. And, and this has been a challenge. Like if you NPM install some module and then you try to import it with the browser, it's just like not going to work. You're going to have to like import the node modules folder. And if that, if that dependency doesn't have any dependencies, it might work. But the second it refers to another dependencies by a bare import, it breaks. And so there's this technology um, that is in the process of being standardized uh, called import maps. Uh, and Guy, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so import maps are, I mean, they have come out of like many years of, of spec work and discussion about how you, you resolve modules in the browser. Uh, because, and again, it, it sort of um, builds on top of that base node use case you just described, where as, as a user, you just want to import the, the package or the code that you're loading. And uh, how, how do we do the same kind of thing in the browser? How do, how do we enable the browser to just load a package um, where you don't have to necessarily copy and paste a URL, look up a URL somewhere? Um, and then also, as you say, that the dependencies also need to do that. So there's this kind of um, iterative process that has to happen if you want uh, things to depend on each other. And, um, so import maps uh, grew out of what was originally uh, the idea that you would have be able to hook the, the resolve function in the browser. And then uh, it kind of simplified down into uh, let's just have a map. And the the closest we had to that in the past was probably something like the require.js configuration, which was an old loader um, for JavaScript where you could write this map configuration and, and point names to different uh, target paths. And 
it's in, in many ways quite similar to that. In, in other ways, it's, it's quite different to that. Um, but the core principles are the same, that, that you, you write at this JSON object that has an imports uh, field in it. And there you can just write a dictionary of your packages and the URLs that they can be found at. And it also permits subpath um, mappings, which is actually a, a very interesting use case as well, um, and touches on, on tree shaking and features like that. Um, but import maps have been under development actually for quite a while. And uh, still, there still seems to be a little bit to work out, but they're shipping in Chrome today uh, under the experimental web platform features flag. Uh, and, and I think there's, there's been a lot of wider platform interest in it as well, uh, with projects like Dino also adopting import maps as the way that they want to uh, use their specifiers. So uh, just to touch on it briefly, um, both Dino and Node.js now use URLs in their uh, module systems, like the browser. And so import maps naturally will, will have the same semantics when, when applied in all these environments, which I think is very cool. Yeah, and, and one of the things um, that we adopted in Node in our ESM implementation, and I believe that this started as a proposal from Jan Krems, but you can correct me if, I, I know you were actively involved and some other people were actively involved, but I think it was- Yeah, no, it was uh, Jan's proposal and I mean, but uh, lots of discussion goes into these things, of course. Yeah, um, so it's called uh, package exports, and it's a new field in the package JSON called exports, where you can define uh, the external interface for your package. So, you know, um, you're probably used to putting in a main or a browser field when you're um, writing a package that's going to be consumed. Um, the algorithm that Node has when you like, you know, import Lodash is it goes into the Node module folder, it looks for a, a folder with the name of the specifier, it looks for its package JSON, and then it looks for main. This is something that's actually um, specified in our documentation. You could look it up and look up how the resolution algorithm works. Um, you know, it's fun for me, maybe not for you. I don't know. I like reading smart text sometimes. So package exports, um, without them, you can kind of like deeply traverse into a module and grab any file from anywhere in the module. With package exports, um, you're able to define that interface. So you can say, you know, like slash deep, dot slash deep module and um, have a path to it. And when someone imports your module slash deep module, like it will resolve into that. The, part of the reason why this is so powerful, um, beyond just the fact that it's cool to like kind of have this public-private interface for your package, which is a great programming uh, tool, is that it makes every single specifier within a module, assuming that you're writing it this way, absolutely static. And this is something that plays really nicely into import maps. So what it means is that anyone who's consuming your package and specifies something, um, we can like completely statically resolve the path of all of those specifiers and internally in your module as well, all of the specifiers that you write are also statically resolvable. Now, now this is making the assumption, of course, that you're writing a tree that is all ESM or written in a, like a, sub, a subset of common JS. This is something you probably can lint for and it's a way in which like NPM or other package managers can likely give extra signal that, that packages are written this way. But the magic of it is if you had a tree in the future, so now I'm doing my speculative uh, fiction. Uh, it's our five year fiction, yeah. Yeah, but, but in like five years, let's say you have a tree where all the modules has the, have this package exports field identified. Another tool at install time could go through and completely generate an import map for you um, from your node modules um, tree. And the exports map also has this thing called conditional exports, where for each entry point, you can specify an export for particular runtimes. So you could at install time um, generate like a browser import map or a node import map. And then you could have the exact same uh, generic node modules folder, completely static, no transpilation, and have different code paths depending on the import map that you're using. Um, and this is something that there's an awesome tool out there right now called Snowpack. It's part of the Pika project that's done by Fred Schott that, that is experimenting a lot with I mean, they're doing transpilation and they're making a new folder called the browser folder and like they've gone in a slightly different direction, but they are playing with tools that can generate import maps. They are playing with import maps as a way of allowing for bare specifiers inside of the browser. And it's really cool kind of seeing these kind of tools um, in a way writing kind of their fan fiction of what they'd like to see the future of web development be. 
Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a very very compelling use case uh, to be able to see uh, the style of uh, package management port to the browser, and uh, I think it was it was amazing that uh, so as we were working through some of these problems in the Node.js modules group, that we were able to look slightly wider than Node.js again and and look at import maps and see what was going on there. Because I mean, when we were discussing this in in the original days of the modules meetings, uh, import maps were still relatively new. I mean, they, they're, I think they're much more widely understood today. Um, but, but we were very much sort of having to keep an eye on, on these new technologies and, and then try and come up with, with something that was compatible with it. And, and what's very cool about exports is we ended up designing it in a way that it, it, it works quite naturally with import maps. So the way you define your, your package boundary uh, in your package JSON with this export field uh, very naturally uh, works with the same way that you would want to define the import map for that package uh, and sort of have the converse names of, of import and export. So one is the how the package de defines itself to be consumed and then the import map is how you as the consumer are, are consuming packages. And um, the, the encapsulation was, was such a huge feature as well Again, I, 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 with these kinds of things, I never quite know who to credit because these, these ideas get dropped in and you never know quite who is, is, is behind them. And uh, I guess when, when you think these things through, it's nice always to imagine it's one, one's own idea, but you know, we're all discussing these things and things get really mixed up. Um, I, as far as I'm aware, it was uh, Rob Palmer was, was the original proposer of, of the exports encapsulation. In oh, the really? Field. Yeah. Uh, and and that they they'd been using something similar at Bloomberg, and uh, uh, so that they they valued encapsulation and and valued in their internal workflows. Um, I mean, certainly cor correct me if I'm wrong, but this is as much as I've been able to glean from the process. So, uh, <laughs> and that that encapsulation is huge because normally when you publish a package to npm, you change one internal module. Maybe you didn't realize it, but a user was importing that module and relying on its interface. Uh, so it, it really uh, makes that package boundary very well defined. And also that enables optimizations, which is cool because now you could optimize that package uh, and you can load fewer files. Uh, you, could, uh, you could be removing all the exports and, and doing tree shaking like optimizations to the package the exports field and that's something that I've been exploring recently uh, with with the latest release of JSPM is how we can how we can optimize this this exports field um, and, and what it does at the moment is it actually automatically uh, treats all of the definitions in the exports field as the entry points of the package in a roll up code splitting build it does a code splitting build and then you get the chunking and the code sharing and the minimum number of modules as part of your actual package management process. So it sort of almost um, becomes an implicit build process. It's, it's no longer something you have to define that the configuration for the build yourself. You don't have to go into roll up a web pack and say, I'm building these files. Mm -hmm. It can automatically try and optimize those individual packages for you, which, which is, I think another step as we try and get these individual package um, import maps running in the browser. Very close, cool. like smart bundles. Yeah, and, and doing it automatically based on the information because the exports is exactly the information you need to know to be able to optimize the interface of a package. Uh, so I think there's, there's, some there's lots of interesting tooling that can build on top of that field. And this is, yeah, a, 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 I think a great success of that process, that field, because I never would have imagined that it would have been possible to ship it, or I, I never would have imagined proposing it personally. So it's very, very nice to see that out of this process we could these things could emerge. Uh, yeah. I guess like one of the biggest differences, and I, I think we're getting close to time. Um, oh, so sure. We have some closing thoughts. But what, one of the things I think is rather interesting is that if you look at the way that people have been writing um, like kind of JavaScript module systems for the last couple of years, they were all quite dynamic. And one of the like real advantages that ESM has, in my personal opinion, over like, you know, common JS is the fact that it is a static module system. It has these phases. You can do this kind of like introspection and smart things with it because of its static nature. And I, and I feel like these various technologies that we've been talking about have been kind of like leaning in to 
the fact that it's static. We're talking about all the various like static, like kind of like metadata uh, to a certain extent, but, but you know, like unlike Node, unlike Browserify, unlike Babel, which had all these kind of dynamic build steps, which if you, if you need a bundler, like at the point, I, I kind of, I, I gave a talk last year um, and I talked about like nihilistic uh, transpilation. And it's kind of like this idea that like once you have to have a transpilation step, it's already dynamic. So you may as well just like, just keep strapping things onto it. But when we start from this like kind of static core and add, you know, kind of more static insight, we're, we're ending up with this like, kind of really nice um, result, as you're saying, where like we can implicitly determine all of these things mm -hmm. because of the static nature of it and end up with something that is much more flexible in my personal opinion. And, and I think what it comes down to as well is, is making it, well, at least <laughs> trying to uh, in, in, this, in this eventual goal, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to make it easier for users to, um, to optimize their packages, easier for users to configure their build systems uh, and, and try and uh, like, in lots of ways, the complexity around JavaScript tooling and stuff has been the sort of Cabrian explosion of, uh, of you know, methods and, and ways of doing things. And um, there, there are both benefits and costs to that. And, and the, the benefits have been huge in exploring all, all these different workflows. Um, but, but maybe now we're, we're moving into a phase where there's a little bit more consolidation between tools. I mean, we've been having discussions with uh, Tobias on Webpack and we've been having discussions with Rollup and we've kind of been br bridging, bridging a little bit more between tools and, and trying to build conventions that can, that can allow things to be a little bit more implicit and, and put less overhead on the user to get every exact configuration right. And I think that's the hope with some of this stuff. Uh, it's still a lot of work to go, uh, certainly. Uh, yeah, I guess a closing thought uh, for me, uh, I used to work at this startup and, and one of the, the claims was this concept of a short time to wow. And when I think about like what I loved about web technologies, I don't come from a traditional background. The thing about the web and the browser and JavaScript in particular, which like enabled and empowered me was just that like, it was so intuitive and quick to get started. And I feel like, we as an ecosystem have had to layer on a lot of complexity to like allow for advanced productivity. Um, but the result is that we've lost a lot of that short time to wow. And I know that we're talking here about a lot of like kind of, you know, it's not nothing, all these extra technologies that we're talking about, but I do really hope that in like three years in four years, uh, a lot of these can be baked and, uh, and kind of generated enough that we can get back to that kind of thing where it's like, Hey, like here's a link. And now I'm going again. Um, and, and I'm personally just like really excited for that future. So guys, thank you so much um, for joining me today and participating in, in this. Sure, thanks, Miles. Yeah. And uh, to everyone who's tuned in, uh, thank you so much for watching and we'll be around for questions in a bit. Have a good one. Cheers.